Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. We're going to go ahead and start in chapter 1 and 2 of Hebrews this evening. I'm not sure exactly how far we'll get, but I believe that we can make some great strides in that. Before we do begin, though, there's a couple things that we need to discuss to really get the, the full effect of the two chapters we're going to be studying this evening. Uh, first of all, when it comes to historic context, typically when we're talking about historic context in Bible study, we're talking about two things. We're talking about the audience that it was written to and the author. And so we try to think of it from those two vantage points. And that's correct. That is a good thing. I'm in no way disparaging that or saying that that is inadequate. But I do think when we're reading the New Testament especially, there's another angle that we can sort of readjust our thinking to to give us an, a new understanding of context and what it means. So when I say that we think about the original audience and the people that would have been reading it at the time that the book was written, for example, we tend to think of, let's take, for example, First and Second Samuel as what would this have meant to somebody that was living in the monarchical period? Somebody that actually was watching these events unfold or, or was reading this shortly after those events had unfolded. Uh, so somewhere around 1000 AD, something like that, or maybe shortly thereafter. And that is a correct way to look at the scriptures. However, especially when we're studying Hebrews, it's important to think of another kind of context. And that is, there's a lot of Old Testament citation in Hebrews. There's a lot of Old Testament citation throughout the New Testament, but especially in Hebrews. And so because of that, sometimes it is helpful for us to not only think about what would this have meant to the original Israelites when they were reading this Old Testament passage, but also what would this Old Testament passage mean to a first century Jew? What would that have meant to them? How would they have understood that? And so it's not just important to look at the original context from the perspective of what the original audience thought of it, but also several hundred years later in the time of the New Testament period, what did those passages mean to them then? Now, keep in mind, they were also trying to look at the context of the original audience. That was something that we know from historic records, uh, from Jewish scholarship, that that was something that they also took into consideration. But the point is, they also have experiences now that the Jews that originally read those documents don't. They had a level of hindsight. They had seen some of the prophecies fulfilled. And so they would have thought of the Old Testament passages in a slightly different way than the original audience would. And it is helpful to us to understand what that would have meant to them at that time. And so we'll give some examples of that as we go on, but I just want you to keep that in mind as we go throughout this study. It's also important to note that while they would have read the Old Testament, by this point in Israel's history, knowledge of the original Hebrew language was not as strong as it was when that was their native language. By this point, most Hebrews spoke Aramaic as their native language, and they would have studied the Old Testament probably in the original Hebrew to a degree, but most of them probably would have been more familiar with what's known as the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, it's a very good Greek translation. It's, it's not, you know, wildly different. But just be aware of the fact that sometimes when they do a citation in a New Testament book, if it looks slightly different than it does in your English translation of the Old Testament, that could just be a, a translation choice that was made by whoever translated your Bible. But it also may be because they're not actually quoting the Hebrew Old Testament. They're quoting the Septuagint. That's a very common thing in Hebrews. And so we'll actually see a couple of those examples where the wording is slightly different. The meaning is still the same. But the reason that they don't quite line up exactly with the Old Testament version you have in your Bible is because that's based on the Hebrew Old Testament. They might have been quoting from the Septuagint. Uh, to them, that really was sort of the standard. It was sort of like their KJV. And so that would have been something they relied on heavily. And it's also important to know that Hebrews 1 contains seven direct references to the Old Testament, 
And of those seven direct quotations, five of them are Psalms. Now, it also contains a couple of other allusions and sort of points back to a few ideas, but we have seven direct quotations and then five of them directly from the Psalms. Psalms gets quoted more than any other book in the book of Hebrews. And then also, this is a, a short one, but one that I find really interesting, being somebody that has a background in rhetoric and debate. Greek philosophy had this idea called the diatribe. So this is something that you're probably familiar with. It's one of those things that you know, you just don't know that you know it. So the diatribe is a rhetorical device that when whoever was writing an epistle was explaining something, they would essentially come up with an imaginary opponent. And so that particular device is when they are arguing with an imaginary person. They're sort of anticipating what an argument against the point that they're making might be, and then they are making that argument in response to it. And again, this is something that you probably are already familiar with and just never put a name, a fancy name to it like the diatribe. For example, Scott uses this a lot in his lessons. He'll bring, it, bring up a point, and then he'll bring up what the counterpoint may be, and then he'll rebut the counterpoint. Uh, I've seen Billy use it before. And so th there's a lot of people here that use it. It's probably in most of the sermons that you've heard. You just never thought about it that way. But be aware of that as we're going through this study because this is a rhetorical tool that the Hebrew author uses a lot. And so you're going to see he's sort of countering the argument before the counterargument is actually made. So we'll go ahead and, and dive into this. We're going to, weirdly enough, start out our study in Hebrews by looking at Psalms 2. So if we will go ahead and go to Psalms 2, and when you're reading through this, I want you to keep a couple of things in mind. First of all, let's do that same thing that I was talking about a second ago, where instead of reading it from the perspective of a 21st century Christian or even a Israelite that would have been reading this for the first time, let's look at it through the lens of a first century Jew, somebody that doesn't know who Jesus is, has never heard the gospel before, but is familiar with the Old Testament. Let's try to read it from that perspective. And also, I've taken the verses, the verse notations out of this up here. So if you read along in your Bible, that's fine, but, but kind of ignore the verse notations and just think of it as one long continuous document because that's how they would have understood it and that's how they would have read it at the time. And so I'll explain that a little bit later. So let's go ahead and read Psalm 2. Why are the nations restless and the peoples plotting in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let's tear their shackles apart and throw their ropes away from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them, and he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will announce the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have fathered you. Ask it of me and I will certainly give the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now then, you kings, use insight. Let yourselves be instructed, you judges of the earth. Preserve the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, that he may not be angry, and, and you perish on the way. For his wrath may be kindled quickly. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. So, looking at this psalm, what do you think this psalm would have meant to a first century Jew? Pardon? The anointed one, the, anointed one, the Messiah, King. So that's something that's featured prominently here. Okay, so that's important as well because there's this idea that there is someone out there who is known as the anointed one that a first century Jew would have had the hindsight of having the prophets. And so when this, and, and by the way, most scholars believe that this particular psalm is one of the oldest psalms in the entire book of Psalms. They, they think it actually might be the oldest one. And so... This psalm's been around for a really, really long time. But, to Daniel's point, 
One thing that they might be thinking of in the first century is they're thinking about Isaiah. They're thinking about Ezekiel. They're thinking about all these other prophets they've had since this psalm uh, was written. They're thinking about it from the perspective of, okay, well, yeah, we had kings at one time, and that's important, but we don't really have a king anymore, and we haven't for a really long time, not since they were taken captive into Babylon. Has Israel really had a king in the Davidic line? The line of David has never really been fully established. And so to a first century Jew, they might be thinking about a king, and that's certainly what the ancient Israelites would have been thinking about. But now that they're in the post-exilic period, now that they are in the period that Christ would have lived in, they might also be thinking, maybe this has something to do with the Messiah? Maybe they're thinking about this in a little bit more abstract a way, or, or maybe this is connected to what's going to happen once we do have a king reestablished. And so there's a couple different directions you could go to with this. Um, on the, the surface level, it's obviously about the monarchy. In fact, this particular psalm is what's known as an anointing psalm. It is a song that is sung when the new king is appointed. When he is installed, this song takes place. At least that's what scholars believe uh, the purpose of this song was. And so at his anointing ceremony, this is what you would sing as, as sort of a uh, celebration of the new king coming into power and also an acknowledgement that God plays a part in that because it's talking about God being the one that installs the king, that kind of thing. And so it, it serves a couple of purposes. First of all, it's rejoicing on Israel's part that they have a king, but it's also an acknowledgement that any power, any majesty, any glory that the king has or any good thing that he does ultimately is the work of God. And so that's how the ancient Israelites would have understood it. And then you also have the perspective of the first century Jews that are looking at this and saying, okay, this might also apply to some things that aren't necessarily the king. It could be applying to the same people that Isaiah and Ezekiel uh, and other, these other prophets in the Old Testament were talking about. So it, it could also be looking forward as well. And so, good, there's a couple things in there that we could really take away from that. And so uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and dive into Hebrews 1. So we'll go ahead and, and read that. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he has made purification of his sins... He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, to the extent that he has inherited more excellent name than they. Right, so in this passage, where we see the opening statement from the Hebrew author, there's a couple things that you can look to pretty quickly. First of all, this opening is a bullet train. I mean, it hits hard and heavy and just keeps going. You see, for example, in Luke's gospel, there's a lot of buildup. You have the genealogies. You have Christ's backstory and his birth. In Matthew, you see kind of a similar thing. Uh, this one's a lot more like Mark. It just it dives straight into the action and it keeps going. It's kind of like if you've ever seen The Dark Knight, they, they start out in the middle of an action scene. There, there is stuff already happening in this. And so the Hebrew author, as opposed to a lot of the other epistles that we're more used to, where it'll give an introduction and sort of maybe state uh, the intention that is going on, Hebrews just starts out, right, here's some theology for you right out of the gate. So he talks about this, that uh, he already starts to draw this sort of contrasting idea between the New and the Old Testament, right? Because we see that right there in, in verse 1 that uh, long ago the fathers in the prophets in many portions in many ways. So God is speaking to the fathers and the prophets. Well, who does that cover? That covers the entire Old Testament, doesn't it? Because we could talk about the prophets, and that goes all the way back to Moses, but what about the patriarchs? Well, he's covering both of those. He says the fathers and the prophets. And so the entirety of the Old Testament is going to be the subject matter of what the Hebrew author is wanting to address. He's saying that that's the way it was done in old times. 
and now we have the son. And another point that it brings up here is that this is going to happen, that what they are living in now is the last days. Now, that's important for a couple of reasons, uh, which we're going to address here. Uh, The Bible often mentions the last days. Uh, There's a couple of instances of this, Genesis 49.1. So even in the first book of the Bible, this idea is mentioned. Uh, Numbers 24.14, Isaiah 2.2, and Hosea 3.5. So this is a term, and we'll see this a lot in the book of Hebrews. He's bringing up a concept that the people that are reading at this time would have been very familiar with. And so when he's talking about the last days, it's also interesting that usually this is brought up in a prophetic way. A great example of this, and we don't have time to go through all of them, but in Genesis 49, 1, what's going on there? That's when Jacob is blessing his sons. And so he says, this is what is going to happen to the tribes of Judah or the the tribes of Israel in the last days. And what does he predict in that? If you go to Judah's tribe and the prediction for Judah, his son, it's extremely reminiscent of Jesus. And so by bringing this up and bringing this phrase into the study, what the Hebrew author is doing there is he's evoking prophecies that somebody that is familiar with Jesus, which is going to be the reader of Hebrews, somebody that is already a Christian, already recognizes as an Old Testament prophecy foretelling the Christ. Another thing that is important to to talk about here is if you're looking in these uh, first few verses, I believe it's in verse 3. Yeah, so in verse 3 where it talks about the exact representation, there's a couple of different ways that this can be translated. But the Greek word that is used here is actually the word character. So we're familiar with this. This is a word that we have in English as well. But the Greek word character means an exact representation. And its original understanding is it was used for things that were sealed or branded with some kind of emblem. And so what this is talking about is this is not like a a false representation. This is not something that is a lesser representation. What the word literally means is exact representation. It is an exact impression of the thing that it represents. And so when he brings up this kind of symbolism with Christ, he's not just saying, yeah, Christ is like God in a lot of ways, or Christ reflects God in a lot of ways. No, when he uses this word, any Greek reader will look at that and say, no, Christ is is the exact representation of God. And we see this in the the scriptures, do we not? Because Christ says, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. And so this is just reflecting that truth that we already are familiar with from Christ. So this leads me to my next question here. Why is it so important that the Hebrew writer here contrasts Jesus from the angels? Why does he start out with this idea that we're going to be contrasting Jesus and angels? Why does he bring this up? Right, we we know that from Colossians. So that's one thing that he could be addressing right there is we don't know for a fact that this group of Christians was one of the ones that were worshiping angels, but we do know from Colossians that there were some Christians that were actually worshiping angels. And Paul, of course, denounces that in the Colossian letter. Right, and that's a great point, is what he's saying there is When you look at this introduction, you already have the prophets, you already have the fathers, so the patriarchs, and then you also have the angels. And so basically he's saying Jesus is better than all of that. There's an all-inclusive feature to this introduction that he's giving here that Jesus isn't just better than the fathers. He's not just better than the angels and better than the prophets. He's better than all of it. Like he is superior to everything that we're talking about here. You could even say that about creation itself because he starts out in the beginning talking about how Jesus created the world. And so he is showing Christ's superiority to all things. Uh, Daniel, you had something? Right. And this is actually a point that is going to be made later in the chapter is that Uh, Jesus is superior to the angels because we have to remember that angels are merely messengers. They're servants. They are not beings that are worthy of worship. And in fact, the word angel means messenger. If you look in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word malak, it, it just means messenger. And so you're exactly right on that is one thing that is going to be brought up a little bit later in the same chapter is 
Jesus is the son, they're just messengers. And so while they may be higher than us in some sense, they may be spiritual beings where we're both spiritual and physical. Regardless of all of that, keep in mind that they're servants just like you are. And so because of that, they are not things that should be worshipped. So uh, excellent thoughts on that. Uh, there were a couple of them. And uh, one other thing that I think is important to bring up here uh, to maybe give a little extra context is that at the time, angels had kind of become a really hot topic of discussion, which I know might seem a little bizarre to us living in this century, but at the time, angels were a relatively newly explored biblical idea. Not to say that angels aren't present throughout the Old Testament, because they are. I mean, we can look, for example, all the way back in Genesis at Isaac, where an angel stayed his hand. And so angels are not a new idea. But in the silent period, in other words, that 400 years between Malachi and the book of Matthew that, that we see where God doesn't speak through the prophets, it was at that point that Jews really got interested in angels and that makes sense because if you look at all of the later prophets, they focus on angels a lot. And so you look at some of the prophets that were written towards the end of the prophetic era. And angels are something that are mentioned frequently, but there's not a lot of details given. And so a lot of Jewish scholars took a real keen interest in this time period in angels. And so because of that, you had some heresies going on, like was being discussed earlier, that there were even some Christians that were worshiping angels. And so while there's nothing wrong in taking an interest in angels and trying to understand it, there were some people in both the Jewish and the Christian community that frankly had taken that way too far and had taken so much interest in them that they were taking it to an unhealthy level. And so that's part of the reason that that was being addressed as well. Uh, also, this is pure speculation, but it's also possible that some people may have been teaching Jesus was angelic. Because we know one of the very early heresies that took place in Gnosticism tried to make this case that Jesus was really just a human and then had the spirit sort of poured into him. We know that there were other problems earlier on with saying, okay, well, Jesus is like God and he is his son in some sense, but he's not really God. And so he's trying to draw, there may have been some people that were drawing the contrast and trying to split the baby. And instead of saying, well, Jesus is God or Jesus is man, they were saying, well, Jesus really was angelic. He was some kind of created being like the angels, but not eternal like God is. And the Hebrew author wants to put this to rest right away. He's saying that, no, he's not like the angels. He's higher than the angels. And so that was one of the points that he's bringing up here. So let's go ahead and read the next few verses so Hebrews 1, 5 through 7. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have fathered you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, And let all the angels of God worship him. And regarding the angels, he says, He makes his angels wind and his ministers a flame of fire. Now you'll notice up there on the board what I've done here is I've italicized all of the direct Old Testament quotations and I've added the verse that it is quoting from there. First we'll look at verse 5, which by the way, Psalm 2 has actually already been referenced a couple verses beforehand, sort of just vaguely, but now he's going to bring a direct quote in from Psalm 2, which you remember we read at the beginning of the class. And so what he's saying there is, you're my son, today I have fathered you. He's bringing in that imagery from Psalm 2. But the reason that I didn't add a verse there, even though I could, because I believe it's verse 7, um, what he's talking about there, he's wanting to quote the entire psalm. Because remember, we have book chapters and verses. They didn't. And so when he brings up a quotation from the psalm, he's quoting the entire thing. He's wanting to invoke the idea underlying the entirety of the psalm. For example, if I were to stand up here and say, uh, encamped along the hills of light, you all know that, but your mind automatically goes to faith is the victory. If I were to do the same thing with a prayer, which some of the psalms are, uh, we'll, we'll do one that's actually a song and a prayer. Uh, My soul magnifies, you think of the Magnificat, which of course is a prayer of Mary. And so, when 
he is quoting a small portion of that psalm, what he means to convey is the entirety of it. And the entirety of it, he's bringing up while he's teaching Jesus. Which means that he is saying that whole psalm is about Jesus. And if you read it, even though you were trying to think of it from the standpoint of a first century Jew, which is what I ask you to do, your mind couldn't help but wonder to Jesus, right? Because the whole thing is reminiscent of him. For example, one of the verses that we looked at in Psalm 2, it says, and I will install my king on, on this holy mountain. Remind me again, where did Jesus die? Calvary, a mountain. That's where he became God's king. And if we could go through Psalm 2, I could do an entire lesson just on Psalm 2. But my point is, that whole thing from beginning to end is symbolic of the Christ. And so whenever you see a quotation from an Old Testament passage like a psalm put in there, understand that he's invoking the entirety of the passage, the entire idea underlying the passage, not just that one little line. And that's how an Old Testament Jewish scholar would have thought in the first place. Uh, in a little bit later down where he says, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. That actually comes from 2 Samuel seven fourteen. What's going on there? Well, that is where God is making a promise to David that he will take care of his line. Now, in the immediate context, of course, what he's talking about is Solomon. He is going to bless Solomon's endeavors when he goes to build his temple. But if you sort of zoom out and look at it from the the perspective of a first century Jew and also from our perspective, knowing the gospel and knowing what happens afterward, he's also talking about it from the idea of, I'm going to take care of David's line in its entirety. And this is something that would have been very common to somebody living in that time. For example, we see tablets in ancient periods where they'll be talking about one king, but they'll actually use an ancient king's name. So we don't really have this in modernity, but it would be almost like if I were to say the House of Washington. Well, I'm actually a applying that to all of the people that have been president since George Washington. We don't really do that on modernity, but that's kind of how they thought of it. So uh, a great example is there's an ancient pillar that uses Omri, who is one of the kings of the northern kingdom, but he's actually talking about a king after Omri because it would have been after he died, but he's talking about that line, that lineage that has taken place, and that's exactly what is going on here. That reference that he's making, he's talking about Solomon in the immediate, but he's talking about all of the descendants of David, which of course includes Christ, and reestablishing that kingly line from him. And then we see a little bit further down in Deuteronomy 32, 43, that's where he's quoting. Now this is one of those instances where if you were to go to Deuteronomy 32, 43 right now, it wouldn't look like this verse. I mean, it's the same meaning and it's similar, but it's not that exact wording. That's because, again, this is one of those times where the Hebrew author is quoting not from the Hebrew Old Testament, but the Septuagint. And so it's the Greek version of that verse. And so, again, that's really just something to be aware of. And the point that he's making there is, let all of the angels of God worship him. Well, that is a referent back to Jesus. He's saying that sentence doesn't really come into its full understanding. You can't fully understand that passage until you understand that he was talking about Jesus. And we'll just ca uh, carry on from there. The other quotation was uh, Psalm 104.4. We don't have time to get into that one. But again, just like he did with the previous psalm, if you read Psalm 104, that entire psalm, he's invoking the, the meaning behind all of that when he quotes that one verse from Psalm 104. So let's go ahead and read verses, oops, verses 8 through 10. But regarding the sun, he says, your throne, God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your companions. And... You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain, and they all will wear out like a garment, and like a robe you will roll them up. Like a garment they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. 
So a couple of different things here. First of all, Psalm 45, which is being quoted in verse 8, that is another kingly psalm, but that's actually not a coronation psalm like the one that we looked at in Psalm 2. That psalm is about a wedding feast. And so when he's quoting that, he's quoting this imagery that comes from Psalm 45, where he's talking about the idealistic king. Because we know, because we've read Israel's history, there was never a king like the one that is described in Psalm 45, and this is a psalm of David. And so what David is doing in that psalm is he's not setting forth, this is the way that things actually are. He's setting forth an ideal, that this is what the king is supposed to be. This is the relationship that the king is supposed to have with his God, with his people, and because it's at a wedding feast, with his wife as well. And that's all well and good for the context that it occurs in until you realize that, no, actually that idealistic king isn't just an abstract construct. It is the Christ, and it all fits. And if you especially are familiar with the constant language that is used between Jesus and the church, all of a sudden that psalm just, it clicks and so I want you to think about that from their perspective and, and from the perspective of somebody that was reading this at the time. You know the Psalms. You're familiar with them. You've probably read them your entire life. You could do them from memory if you wanted to, because remember, that was their songbook. That was as familiar to a Jew as uh, I Stand Amazed or Amazing Grace or A Common Love is to us. I mean, we could sing it in our sleep. And they have sung that song their whole life. And they think they know it's exact, exactly what it's about. And then all of a sudden, the Hebrew author comes around and says, actually, that song's about Jesus. Can you imagine what a mind-blowing experience that is? When somebody brings that up and you think about it, it's like, oh, yeah, every single piece of that fits with the Jesus narrative. All of it. And so because of that, I mean, I, I can really only imagine what it must have been like to somebody to know that the song that you've been singing your entire life, all of that was pointing to Christ. And that's really going to be the theme of the entire book. Throughout Hebrews, he's going to do this constantly with his readers, is to say, all of these things that you thought you knew, all of these things that you thought, oh yeah, I know that passage, I've got it down pat, I understand exactly what it means. All of a sudden, you're going to look at it with new eyes. You're going to see exactly where Jesus is in all of this. And the reason that that's important to the Hebrew author's overall point is because remember what he's trying to do is convince Jews that are really kind of on the fence and thinking about maybe falling back into Judaism. Paul is making it to where there is nowhere left to fall back on. You want to go back to the Old Testament? you're going to run into Jesus again there too. There is no escape. You are either in Christ or you are out of Christ. There is no halfway. There is no, well, I'll just go back to being a Jew and then I'll be acceptable in God's eyes. No, no, that's not an option anymore. It was at one time, but that has been completely taken away. And I did want to bring up one other thing too. When he's making this argument that you'll notice that he has made a couple of times now, where at the beginning of verse 8, for example, um, he's talking about this is regarding the son, and he's contrasting that with uh, what he was saying a couple of verses earlier where he says, well, to what angel has he said? So to understand what's really going on there is he's sort of making an almost sarcastic rhetorical point. So, for example, if I were to say, you know, I would say that Ralph is a southerner. And someone says to me, I think he might be a Yankee. My rebut may be, well, have you ever known a Yankee to frequently eat grits? Have you ever known a Yankee to drink sweet tea? Have you ever known a Yankee to say y'all all the time? Like, I know that's a silly example, but that's essentially what Paul is doing here. He's saying, look at all of these passages. And by the way, not new passages, not new revelation that I've come up with. All of these Old Testament passages that you people are already familiar with. He can't be talking about an angel there. It doesn't make sense. So the only logical conclusion is what that's addressing is Christ. And so this idea that, you know, we're, we're going to hold up 
some kind of angelic principle or, or think of Jesus as an angel. No, no, no. Those verses don't work if that's true. And so he's essentially leaving his, his rhetorical opponents no way to escape. He's pigeonholing them into one position because it is the correct position. And that's the way he's revealing this truth to him. So we'll go ahead and finish out the chapter here. Verses 13 and 14. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Now, this is an inclusio, which is a, a Greek term meaning a beginning and an end. And so he's sort of bookmarking a reference from Psalm 2 that he did back in verse 5 with a second reference to that same psalm. And so, again, he's just reiterating the fact that all of these ancient prophecies, all of these ancient songs, all of these things that you thought you were familiar with, they were actually pointing to Christ. And he's saying, and to which angel has he ever said something like that? It's never happened. Why? Because they're messengers. Because they are not rulers. They are not entities to be worshipped. They are servants just like you are servants. And so that's exactly what we're seeing here, is that the Hebrew author is making that point that this is something that is referring to somebody higher than the angels. Who is he talking about? And if you know that and you know the gospel in conjunction with that, there's really only one conclusion left to make. He must be talking about his son, who is higher than the angels. And that's where he, he leaves off this particular passage as well. He says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to provide service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? He's saying that the nature of an angel is not one that is supposed to be worshipped. It is one to serve just like you are. Uh, before we wrap up, are there any other questions or comments before we end this evening? All right, well, I will not be back next week, but we will get into chapter two. My dad will be here filling in for me, and then I'll be back the week after that. Thank you so much. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.